are back with our Tuesday spotlights of our DTL women, that's Disciple Thought Leader Women. And we are wanting you to be able to get to know them because you have asked. So we want you to be able to get a glimpse into the why of what they do and how they've done it as a mom and a woman and how they've been able to keep their family first and be able to move forward a message that they feel compelled to share about him. Today, we have our beautiful Sarah Clark from The Dainty Pair. Hi, sweet Sarah. I am excited to hang out with you. Facebook Live terrifies me, as you know, but we're going to pull it together and try. I like it. And if you haven't seen Sarah, check out the Dainty Pair. Her Instagrams are so fun. She's always doing these little dance motifs, having her kids together doing stuff. Just I like watching them just for fun, just to give me a boost during the day. It's so fun. <laughs> If you don't know much about Sarah, I'm going to give you the official bio, and then we're going to jump in so that you know how does she combine food, family, and worship, and do it all so well and have so much fun doing it. I don't know about you. I don't usually connect cooking with fun always, so I want to find out her secrets as well. But the official bio, she married her sweet husband, Tom, in 2010, and they have five children, and they're little and they're darling. Like, they're getting a little bit older, but oh my gosh, what a sweet family. She is the business owner, YouTuber, blogger, licensed esthetician, and former birth doula. This woman does it all, and she plays the <laughs> piano and sings. Like, what the heck? Anyway, they began building a farm with their little babies in order to help them learn the value of work and to ground themselves from the busyness of the world. And what's so funny, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, is that she is not a farm gal. I mean, think pioneer woman, you know, from tractor wheels, uh, heels to tractor wheels. I mean, like, it's like that, like so amazing. Anyway, we're going to find about that. Her company, The Dainty Pair Co., includes a kitchen line and her cookbooks, Grounded, Feel Good, Real Food, and Grounded Holidays. So beautiful. We're going to talk about her gorgeous party that she just had recently and just the joy that that brought. On her blog and various channels, she talks about her passion of home, food, and worship, and she believes that food can bring others together and provide much-needed connection. And isn't that the truth, especially now for the holidays? And we'll chat about how you can do that effectively here. She also speaks on anxiety and PPD and is, an, is passionate about helping others not feel alone in their journey. She really is your new best friend. Like you can put on pajamas and get cozy, and she'll make a yummy charcuterie board, and you'll just have the best time. That is really Sarah. Okay. So Sarah, let's go back because some people may not know that you did not like to cook. You came from kind of a difficult background and, and that was not a thing that you did. In fact, I remember you saying to me once that in, in junior high and high school, like you'd go for wood shop and stuff like that to avoid home ec. Okay. So tell us this journey of how you went from there to here. That is so true. I used to uh, take auto because everybody was taking home economics and I didn't even know what it, exactly that entailed, but I knew if it included anything domestic, I really didn't want to do it. Um, and so I was out changing my spark plugs and fixing dents in my car instead, <laughs> instead of doing what I deemed to be domestic. And it's so funny how we can change and evolve because uh, once we got married, my husband, Tom and I, I just remember like pulling out a cookbook that one of my young women leaders had actually given me as a college present. And it was, I think it was almost a joke because a couple of them had gone in on it because they just knew I didn't <laughs> cook. <laughs> and I think I had told one of them that my husband was just going to have to eat hungry man meals every night, like freezer meals, which in hindsight, <laughs> just wow. Um, I'm just grateful for the progress that we've made. Anyway, I just, I, I do remember watching my mom and my grandma and them cooking and it was special. It was, I, but I liked eating it. I didn't necessarily like <laughs> participating. And once we got married, I just remember pulling that out and I opened the page to like a pumpkin soup recipe and I made it and I put all the ingredients in and I gave it to Tom and he was like, this is amazing because I've been cooking him dry chicken for like, <laughs> you know, a whole year into our marriage. And at one time he was like, is it a possible to like get some sauce for this? He was just so <laughs> sweet and scared. But anyway, yeah. So from there, I just realized that I'm a little bit too ADD to follow a recipe necessarily. And maybe it's just ingrained in my roots because it's more fun for me to just throw things in and experiment. And that came with time. Those recipes really helped me early on. And then I decided that I liked testing things and I liked the creativity of it and the groundedness of it. And 
just, it was way more exciting and fun and peaceful and um, meditative, I guess, than I thought it was. And it just kind of sparked something new in me. So you can teach an old dog new tricks, I guess. <laughs> and I love that nod to your roots of you had watched your mom and your grandma tossing those things in, the smells, yeah. the way things tasted. So that familiarity, I'm sure, helped you sort of bridge that gap of, oh, wow, maybe I can try this. And giving yourself the freedom to do it, to try a new recipe. And I remember you saying to me, like you were serving your family, your extended family, and they'd be like, what is this recipe? Like, put this down already. <laughs> so then you got brave and you decided to do your first cookbook. What was the genesis behind that? What were you thinking? And, and how did that process go? Was it smooth? Was it stressful? Um, it was a little bit stressful in terms of self-doubt. Um, and obviously, creating an, a book in, a, in and of itself, as you know, yes. <laughs> is just, there's a lot that goes into it. It's a several year process. Uh, I started writing things down a little bit, or at least concepts for recipes that I wanted to, um, you know, develop a little bit more years and years ago. And to, I guess, rewind the dainty pair, my company started as a hand stamp jewelry company. And so I felt like I was a little bit stuck there even though I loved doing it, it kind of, when I got pregnant with our fifth baby, I have hyperemesis. And so I'm on IVs the entire pregnancy. And I just knew I could not be stamping and taking care of four other kids and puking all day long, hundreds of times. And so I just knew that it, something was going to have to give. And so I turned my, uh, the dainty pear company into a blog. And I was just thinking, okay, everyone's going to leave. It's okay. It's they're here for their jewelry for sure. And we, I actually ended up growing and making all these amazing friendships. And so I would kind of bring back jewelry here and there throughout the years. And I even still now have nods to jewelry in my shop, although I'm not hand stamping it anymore. And so anyway, I just remember my company's named after one of my daughters because she was our only girl at the time. And it's her nickname I given to her by my grandma, actually. So it's all, it all kind of ties in. It's kind of fun. Um, but I remember being like, well, I have the name Pear in my name. So that means I can do food, right? That means I can, I can kind of switch over. And it was this threshold that was really hard to cross uh, mentally. Although maybe to anybody else, it's like, just do it. Who cares? But I'm just very loyal. When I start something, I'm like, well, this is what I am now. I have to, I have to keep doing that. And so one of the biggest growth points throughout the years has been to allow myself to, you know, grow in and out of things that I felt prompted to do and to start and to allow for that change and that development and not kind of get in my head thinking I have to stick with this one thing just because I've already told people that's what I do now. I love that because especially women, we can get in that gear and think, ooh, whether it's, I don't think I can shift the gear or I'm not allowed to shift the gear or what if I fail in shifting that gear, right? But I love your mentality, which is I'm going to add on, I'm going to expand, I'm going to increase my tool belt and, and flourish more rather than, oh, now I'm going to not ever do that again. So did right. you have any worries about switching into this food thing? Like, is, is it going to be good recipes or people going to like it? Or it, did you have any of that worry? Um, horrifying. Yes, I was terrified. <laughs> and even up until even this second book has been a little bit better for me that way. Um, Cause I do feel confident in the recipes and we've just tried them over and over and really perfected them. And, um, you know, everybody's going to have different taste buds. And so I have to remind myself of that, even just between me and my husband, we are so different that I just have to remember that if somebody doesn't like something, we're all so different and it's my book. So it's, I put it in there because it's something I love and I believe in. And that did take kind of a boost of confidence to, you know, be okay with, because I don't want to disappoint anybody. I'm somebody who wants to please everybody and I want to be friends with everybody <laughs> and I don't want to let anybody down. So that it was actually really scary. But, um, once, especially for during that first book, uh, for sure. But then we've kind of, I feel like I've kind of grown a little bit more confident in it. I love it. And you have taken some of these risks with that 
okay, I'm going to branch off into this. And then you just ended up with the farm. Okay. Tell me how that works because you were telling me I am not an animal person, but you have like goats, like, right. And chickens or, <laughs> oh my gosh. So tell me how that all came about. Um, yeah, we were living in Dallas and we came to visit for some reason. And we ended up looking at this house and it's on property. And I was like, I don't know. I just, I just never actually envisioned that we'd have animals on it, but I'm like, we could have crops and <laughs> just, you know, I'm just thinking pre-second coming, like, what can I do in the world to make our space ready and prepare every needful thing? <laughs> so um, anyway, so I kind of had this vision in my mind's eye of things that our home could be used for because it just felt like a lot of home. It felt like a lot of land. It felt really overwhelming jumping into something. And we decided we were going to remodel every single wall of the entire house and <laughs> rip things out. And we lived in a, in a trailer in an RV with our five kids on the land while that was happening. And so, and in a hotel and then an apartment when the pipes froze in the RV. So it's, it kind of developed. When I look back, I feel like it's all happened pretty fast, but it was really just one step at a time. It's like, okay, we're going to buy this land. Okay. And we're going to do this and then this, and it just kind of evolved, but we felt good about it every single step of the way. And we were just kind of following our gut. My husband and I have always kind of done that. We had five kids in five years and have, you know, tried to grow businesses and just do different things that have required not a lot of logic, but a lot of faith and gut, gut checks. <laughs> I love that. And that gut instinct and that I would love to just tap into that for one second, your ability to work with your husband and your family, that is huge. And that takes a certain skill set and a, a certain level of respect and understanding of being able to go back and forth and pass the baton. Do you have any tips on that of, I talk to a lot of women who are like, I love what I'm doing, but my husband doesn't really understand and understand the need that I have to create more something, especially as my kids are getting older. Any thoughts yeah. on, on working well with a spouse? Um, I will also say we grew into that because we almost got divorced many times in our <laughs> past 12 years. <laughs> Maybe not 100% all the way, but just to be honest, like, no, it's not all smooth sailing. But yeah, I mean, I feel like we both have, definitely both have the same core values, but then we really, like when it comes to our kids, we wanted them to... I'm trying to think of how to say it. We wanted to have a reason for them to work hard and have some manual labor and to like, we just had the same goals for our kids. And so we're like, Hey, which, how can we work towards that? And so we kind of started there and then solved for it. And so I think just, and, and even now, um, I think your spouse is never going to 100% understand what you're going through at home or at work, wherever you're, wherever you are, because they're not there all day with you or unless they are, um, then I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> then, um, then that's great because Tom and I did try to work together, uh, in like the same office, same job, same everything for, you know, a while. And it just didn't work out for us. And so I think knowing just what our limits are with each other and I think now it would be a different story but um we were just kind of young in our marriage but now I think just having the same common goals having that respect of okay you're you know this is what you're bringing to the table this is what I'm bringing to the table and adding in some passion projects and some fun and having some room for that and just understanding when they take a few minutes away to to work on that. I think that's huge. Cause he watched me for a long time. Like I had a newborn on my lap. I'm going to demonstrate it for you because uh, <laughs> I, I had like a newborn here and I'm nursing this newborn and I have a hammer in my right hand and I'm just stamping things <laughs> in front of me. And so he just like, he's really sweet and he gives me wings to do that. And I know that's not always the case for everybody, but um, I think just having the honest conversation of, I need this to for my soul. Large. I just came. Yeah. And I mean, when that love is there and you know, they, you, they can actually really see it. Hopefully that it, hopefully it pans out. I don't know. I'm clearly not someone to give marriage advice. <laughs> 
But I love watching the way that you two work together and it is a handoff. It is a supportive, respectful handoff. And I love the point that you make of find that the roles and responsibilities, find your lane. What is your lane? And then being able to give each other that space and that support for that lane. And then finding the common ground of what, what are the common values? And then what's the common ground? Where do we meet together? So we're not on parallel tracks. Yes. So I love that. Yes. Let's let's switch gears for a second because I want to talk about this whole beautiful message that you have about come as you are, break bread at our table. You are all about um, home, family, worship, and you're all about gathering. Like, how can we gather and connect people? Tell me where that came from. This feel, this drive. I would say a drive in everything you do. It's all about gathering and then using that food as that connector. Where did this come from? I do feel like it's a drive. Uh, I think there are a few different places that it comes from. And I will say too, there have been times where I haven't wanted to gather. Like well, coming out of severe postpartum depression, I didn't want to gather. I actually turned off my phone. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And so, you know, there are definitely seasons and times, but I think that, I mean, we're, we know that no man is an island. We are supposed to have each other and we are all part of the body of Christ and we all have a purpose and something that we can bring to the table. and. Uh, ways to help and uh, lift each other. So gathering, I feel like on its own is a very sp uh, spiritual doctrinal concept. And then also growing up, I, I wasn't able to have a lot of people in my home. I had just different family things and uh, my dad was in the military. And so he would be off on deployments. And when he was gone, we would have people over. But when he was home, it was just a lot of kind of turmoil and just different things. And so we clung to the times that we were able to have people come to our home and then it would kind of be over for a while. And then, but it was hard because, you know, I wouldn't want him to be away either. It was just, it was kind of this tricky odd juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was interesting. So um, now that I'm an adult and have my own debit card and my own house, <laughs> I love to gather and I love to have people over and I love um I just love the whole the whole thing I love the feeling that's there when people are when their souls are talking to each other when they're talking to, to each other and laughing and uh, or crying or doing whatever it's just it's I mean we've always had we've all probably had experiences where it's not been a good gathering experience I've definitely been there too but <laughs> but um I, I just think that great things happen when we come together and gather and can partake of each other's like gifts and goodness. I love it. And in fact, you just did, you had your holiday cookbook that just launched. It's gorgeous and it's delicious. It's so amazing. And you make us look good. Like for those of us who are not <laughs> gourmet cooks and chefs and charcuterie board people that it's just so it's, it's good ingredients and you can absolutely do it. But I love that you had this beautiful event. It was this gala event and we were talking about it, you know, 350 people there and the food, if you look on her Instagram and look on mine, you can see the the tables laid out and the beautiful lights and people were dressed in their best. And it was a good reason to get dressed up as well as gather. And I remember sitting and, and talking with some of the other women that I was at the table with, and we looked around and we're like, look at what she's created. This experience where you literally were at the front door bringing people in and in this gorgeous gown and your kids are in these matching outfits, but they're, they're helping to serve and they're helping to, to do. And, and it was this family woven through experience, which really did feel like come as you are. And even though we're all dressed to the nines, it was come sit down, have some food. Let's connect. Let's meet some people in the live band. And the really at one point, it just brought me to tears. It was so tender just to see everyone mingle and talk and laugh and and even have this driver of the savior that runs through it, that doesn't hit you over the head, but just is, is sort of melted into everything that you do. Talk, talk to me about this. You have this ability to help people learn how to gather, how to create an environment that gathers, how to cook food that will gather. How is it that you've also been able to weave in this feeling of worship and, and in a very um, Christian sense, a non-denominational sense, what, what's the driver on that? 
Okay. First of all, thank you. That means so much. That's so sweet. Oh, wonderful. Um, oh my gosh. Um, I think it's just because it's just who I, part of who I am now. And it's like, it feels weird to leave it out. Um, I know that's not like a very good answer, but <laughs> I just, no, I so like when it becomes just so part of who you are, I think I, I think I used to try and separate it a little bit more. I've always, you know, I've always carried my beliefs and I would share it when it felt appropriate, but I feel like I've become more un unapologetic. And I think a lot of that too, just in the past year of being in DTLC has helped me realize that there are other people out there that believe these things and we need to kind of band together and be willing to open our mouths and share that with others. Um, one thing that really helped me do that was living in Dallas because people in the South are not ashamed of Christ. They sign up even at, at the school emails or even on the school emails, they're like signing off PTA girl. She's like, um, what was it? She's like blessings in Christ. Tanya or whatever like it's just so unapologetic even in a school system which I love and you know people just aren't offended by it and so it helped me to have that as an example even though they were different religions to be like this is what I believe and I I'm going to share that I'm not going to shove it down people's throats but I'm going to do my best to gather Israel and just try, try and do it in subtle ways and um, just kind of follow promptings. It's, that's definitely a learned thing too, is following promptings. I just remember different times throughout my life getting promptings where I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and kind of like fighting with the Holy Ghost. Um, but now it's just like, well, what do I have to lose? I'm going to follow this prompting. And, you know, it just becomes more of a comfortable thing. So, and one of those things was talking about like, church on my Instagram or um, I always kind of have but being more bold and it's hard to believe like you have to be more and more and more bold because right now being neutral just isn't cutting it in the world so I think just the, especially the past couple of years the way the world has felt and just different things that have gone on I'm like no we need to we need to step up just a little bit more I love it. And I love it. You always have your Sunday picture of you guys getting ready to go to church. It's just cute and genuine. And then there's the other day you were playing the piano and singing How Great Thou Art, just a little snippet of it. Like these really real and genuine things. And that's what I love for the women listening, that it's not, you know, necessarily giving out scripture every two seconds or, or you know, pounding the pulpit. It's, it's this woven into your daily life of how you live and be a disciple of Christ. And for those that are just joining us, DTLC is Disciple Thought Leadership Circle. And we have a circle that after the retreat, you can come and be part of the leadership circle. And we help one another being a mom aunt in business and in sharing an effective message. And we do it for him. So I love what you've done with doing it for him and being able to say, this is the way I show up as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I do it through gathering people through food. And I know now you are helping people bring back Sunday dinner, not your mom's Sunday dinner where she slaved all day in the kitchen and then did all the dishes. Right. But she's, <laughs> It's, it's making people a part of the Sunday dinner and everyone chopping vegetables and chatting in the kitchen. And that's a really big part of gathering and connecting is all the conversations that happen and when your hands are in the soapy suds and whatever. So for, as I know we're getting ready to wrap up here, but any thoughts on that of people wanting to bring back that, that Sunday dinner, any tips for that or things that you're doing that will help them to make that happen? Yeah, I think, I just think about, you know, just studies have shown that people who have, or families that have dinner together, their kids are a high percentage less likely to have A, B, and C issues or, you know, struggle with certain things that are more preventable. And so, yeah, I think if you're not regularly having sun er, a dinner at all together, starting with a Sunday dinner is the perfect segue into doing that and it's a day that does feel more set apart from the week even if you aren't a church goer um and I know Sundays can actually be super busy I'm in the primary presidency my husband's in the elder scorn presidency so like it doesn't really feel restful all the time but um there are definitely Sundays where we can make it feel restful and uh, a Sunday dinner is just like uh, something to look forward to it's a time where you know there's not always 
sports or work sometimes. Yes. But you know, at our house, we try and really set that day apart. So if it's not a Sunday dinner for you and it's another day of the week, that's totally fine. But, um, that just feels like kind of universal where it's like, yeah, just plan a Sunday dinner. It feels different and you can invite family over. It's a day where most people um, are able to come over better than any other day of the week. And it's just special. And yeah, that is where a lot of what I'm doing now has sprung from is having Sunday dinners with our family. So I'm, I'm really grateful for Sunday dinner. I believe in it. I have a testimony of Sunday dinner. <laughs> Do it. Let's do it. Well, and I know coming in the new year, you'll have a <laughs> challenge, a three-day challenge of helping you be able to get Sunday dinner. So preparing yourself, preparing the meal, and then preparing the environment simply, yeah. easily for families to gather. And again, great recipes that you have that people can do little pieces. And if you feel overwhelmed with starting with Sunday dinner, start with Sunday dessert. Just start with a dessert and start with something that just brings people to the table and those conversations start to flow. For people listening and who want absolutely to know more and do more, I mean, I wish we had so much more time. She just got back from New York. And then the next thing you see, she's out feeding, you know, the animals on the farm. And <laughs> it's just so fun that you keep it so down to earth, making food and, and doing jewelry and doing makeup and doing all these fun things and not taking yourself too seriously and being a perfectionist about it, but being able to do something good and enjoy the doing. Oh, it's just such a gift that you have for people listening. They're going to want to connect with you. What's the best way for them to connect? Um, usually just over on Instagram at the dainty pair. And then on my website's the dainty pair.com. So Love those it. are the two kind of places we are the most <laughs> and so many fun things and free things that you can check out and also tips and tools on how to do her recipes and also just fun living life little life lesson tips and things on her social media are just so fun it is just a joy that you create a space for people to gather and then teach how to do some of these things so you can move forward and do that with your own family sarah thank you so much uh, for being with us today you're so good to me thank you love you guys Love it. And if you love these little spotlights of getting to know these women in the Disciple Thought Leadership Circle, check out the other interviews. We usually do them on a Tuesday and you can check out how a one gal went from power tools to a nonprofit and helping women who are um, in the underserved in the community people who have learned how to take their counseling things and then being able to expand it, being able to take gardening and be able to start healing family relationships through it. You can meet all of these beautiful women and they're just like you, but learning some, some cool school uh, skills and tips and tools to be able to say, ah, I can now be a more effective instrument for him just in simple, beautiful, intentional ways. And as always, if you're interested in learning more about our retreats, we invite you to check it out. We do free calls, just tell you what we do and see if it's a fit and if it will help you up level and become that beautiful, more effective instrument for him. Meanwhile, thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us and helping you to find and fulfill your purpose for him.